get started. So welcome everybody to yet another fantastic edition of our Science discussion series. My name is Jeff Hunt. I direct the LabX Public Engagement Program here at the National Academy of Sciences. And I co-host this series along with the wonderful folks from the AAAS Center for Public Engagement. I think we have Emily and I see MC. Anybody from AAAS want to say hello? Hi, this is Emily. Uh, looking forward to today and uh, also looking forward to perhaps seeing some of the folks from this virtual group in real life at our meeting in Seattle in uh, February. So we'll have some opportunities there for get togethers at our public engagement reception and elsewhere. Um, so if you have ideas about other ways to get together in real life during the meeting, let me know and we can start to uh, compile those. Excellent. Um, so before we get started with the webinar, I just want to do some brief housekeeping. If anybody out there is interested in being on a mailing list for this webinar series, just put your email and your name in the chat box. I'm just trying to get a sense of who is sort of a regular and who wants to keep be kept updated on what we're doing with SciEngage as we try to be a little bit more quote unquote professional with how we do this. Um, but again, it's very informal. Uh, so turning to today, um, I'm very excited to do some really deep diving into science communication. And so we have members of a new standing committee here at the National Academies on Advancing Science Communication Research and Practice. Uh, so we have Holly Rhodes, who's the study director for that committee and is at the National Academies. And then we have three of the actual committee members themselves, including co-chair Dietram Schoifler from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. We have Angela Bednarik, who's at the Pew Charitable Trust and Laura Helmuth, who is at the Washington Post. Um, so what I'm gonna do is basically just hand things over to Holly. Uh, she will sort of get the discussion started. We'll hear from our panelists. As always, there will be a lot of time for discussion. If you have questions, again, please throw them into the chat box. And I'm sure once we get to Dietram, he will open the floor up to everybody's microphones. In the meantime, if you could please keep yourself on mute unless you are actually the one speaking. So Holly, it's all yours. All right, well, thank you, Jeff. Um, I just want to say thank you to you and, and everyone at SciEngage for inviting us here to talk about the Standing Committee. Um, we're really looking forward to a good discussion with everyone. Um, so I'm just going to share a little bit about our history and how we uh, formed the Standing Committee and how we got to this place. And then I'll be turning it over to Dietram, who will share a little more about our goals and mission and, and some of our work. Um, but thank you very much for this for this chance. Um, so the origin for this Standing Committee really started back in 2012 when we hosted the first um, colloquium on our series on science, the science of science communication at the National Academies. Um, that was the first of four of the colloquia that we've, we've held, um, but really that first one focused on bringing social scientists and science communication and other related fields together um, to share the state of the art and to um, talk about where research was in the field. Uh, the success of that event led to another one in 2013 um, <clears throat> which really focused on bringing practitioners into the into the um, space and more conversation there. And then that led to a, um, those two colloquia together really led to the idea for our consensus study um, that we published in 2017, Communicating Science Effectively. And uh, the purpose of that report was really to synthesize um, what we had learned so far in science of science communication and focusing primarily on topics that are uh, especially challenging to communicate about, uh, controversial topics. Um, <clears throat> but it also primarily laid out a research agenda for um, how to build the field of, of science communication and advance both research and practice um, and how the two could really work together. And so from that study, we held a, a third colloquium which featured partnerships and we uh, ha held a series of planning meetings and um, other listening events that, that tried to identify a way to have a sustained effort to help the recommendations that we laid out in that consensus report really uh, come into being and, and how we could advance the field. And that's what led to um, this standing committee 
And so our effort really is centered around um, advancing the field and we launched in 2018, uh, late 2018, and um, are now, we're supported by a number of foundations, the Rita Allen Foundation, the Kavli Foundation, the Simons Foundation, Science Sandbox, the Alfred B. Sloan Foundation, the WT Grant Foundation, the Burroughs Welcome Fund, the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation, and two different funds in the National Academies, which I think um, that broad support really speaks to, um, you know, the importance people are placing on science communication right now. And uh, our committee brings together uh, 16 experts in both research and practice. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dietrich. My, he's gonna tell you what we've been working on and uh, what we're trying to do. So thank you again. Thank you, Holly, and uh, thank you all for, for joining us. Um, uh, I'm, I'm speaking at least partly also on behalf of my co-chair, Ann Bartuska, who is unfortunately not here. I wouldn't, uh, wasn't able to, to be here today. Um, when we talk about um, the, 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 the broader mission of, of our, of our uh, committee um, and, and advancing science communication research and practice, we mean science communication really in a very um, uh, expansive way. Uh, we mean that partly, of course, as, as, as one-way communication of scientific information, that is an important part, but we mean it maybe more importantly as a, as a, a, a broad, at least bi-directional, maybe multi-directional uh, dialogue uh, between the different, the different groups that are, that are involved in, the, in, in, in science communication more broadly. Uh, the, the work of the committee is, is informed by the idea that, that, that communicating science uh, is more important than it's ever been. Some of you may have seen the the recent Dear Colleague letter from from the NSF that echoes uh, some of those ideas um, of, of of the increasing and central role that science communication needs to play play in the in the uh, in, in science based science communication in the scientific enterprise. Um, and we believe that that has to be that form of that type of science communication has to be evidence based, absolutely, but also inclusive and equitable. Um, figuring out ways of, of innovative ways of, of pushing those ideas forward and connecting science really with all parts of, of society um, is, is, is what this committee is about. Toward that end, um, we have at least three different um, focal areas. Um, first and foremost, um, uh, and this has really come out of some of our earliest meetings, uh, where, where our discussions uh, coalesced again and again around the issue of diversity, equity, um, and, and inclusive, inclusion uh, across all areas of, of, of science communication. Uh, so how can, we, how can we not just focus um, on, the, on the sometimes proverbial choir, um, but how can we make sure that we engage more uh, individuals, more groups um, uh, with with science and, and allow uh, all groups in society and all individuals to benefit from science ultimately. Um, the second focal area is really about us helping to amplify existing efforts. So rather than replicating um, existing efforts, how can, what role can the committee in particular play in helping uh, um, amplify and increase the impact of, of existing efforts. And, 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 and the third focal area related to that is capitalizing in particular, of course, on the, on the role that the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine uh, can play as an institution um, that, can, that can influence and, and help connect um, um, different groups and, 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 uh, and, and, and convene broader conversations around the themes that we just, that we just outlined. Uh, this webinar is partly designed as that, meaning for our committee to listen um, and, and get input, um, hear ideas, questions, um, um, help us think about what, what some of those directions uh, forward might be. Toward that end, what we were hoping to do is um, just quickly tell you uh, very briefly about, about three different areas uh, that, that we've been working on and we've been um, starting to, to, uh, to push forward in. Uh, one, the connection between research and practice, and I will tell you a little bit more about that. Um, after that, we'll have Angela talk um, about the boundary spanning um, uh, area of work that we've engaged in and, 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 uh, and, and, and are planning next steps. In. And then finally, Laura will talk about building institutional support for, support for science communication um, in, in, in particular. Uh, but let me 
start very briefly, and then of course, as as Holly and 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 Jeff said, then we'll 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 have hopefully uh, plenty of time for for input from all of you um, and, and and a lively discussion. But let me first um, uh, talk about the, the the connection of of research and and practice in particular, which is. Uh, as you can tell from the name, is is a central focus of of, of the standing committee. It's really at the at the very heart of our mission. mission. Um, uh, and 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 this really goes already both ways. On the one hand, um, I think some people have rightfully argued that social science has not always done as good a job as it could have done in in in, in curating and creating knowledge that was particularly useful for communities of practice. Um, so our our goal partly is to 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 um, to curate what we already know and to, to guide the creation of new um, uh, knowledge in, in the science of science communication. But, but at the same time, uh, that, that's particularly relevant for, for communities of practice, but at the same time, um, also um, helping inform the kinds of work that is being done by the needs of, of, of different communities of practice. So really have a, have a bi-directional um, dialogue um, between those, those two or actually multiple groups because it's really not just two groups. Um, the 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 goal ultimately is to institutionalize, um, and you'll hear some of that those collaborations between researchers and, and practitioners uh, to to support and and I want to tell you about a few of those things um, existing partners or uh, to support partnerships either encourage those partnerships or support existing partnerships uh, through grants and 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 and, and other types of mechanisms. Um, and then really uh, thinking about ways of of, of advancing, um, our, our, our practices, our research um, to reach a, a wide variety of diverse, diverse communities. Um, what we've done so far, and, and I want to particularly highlight because some of you may have seen the press release that, uh, that went out, or the release that went out, I think, a week or two ago um, on the, the two partnership awards that uh, the Standing Committee recently awarded. Um, uh, two of those were focusing on, on um, Partnerships, explicit partnerships. One was focused on 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 an exploratory grant. Uh, those partnerships are are really really exciting from our perspective because they they uh, not only connect very diverse sets of of stakeholders. Um, for example, uh, um, uh, universities, uh, police departments, um, uh, medical professionals, and ICUs. Um, but also serve a wide variety of, of, of stakeholders as, as either partners in the communication effort or the recipient of those conversa uh, the, the, those communication efforts, ranging from, from patients to police officers leading to better police practice, using science communication um, and testing approaches empirically to, 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 to better communicate um, uh, in, in, in a wide variety of settings. Uh, so I encourage you to 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 look at those. We'll we'll report back on those and 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 uh, as as the committee progresses, uh, this is actually the second round. Um, there, uh, the Rita Allen Foundation has has supported a, a previous round of those, uh, many of which uh, were uh, two of which um, uh, were funded and 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 also highlighted at at the most recent um, uh, colloquium that I'll talk about in a second. That colloquium uh, took place in. Uh, in, in Irvine, California, um, and uh, and focused on misinformation in particular. Um, so the problem, of course, that that many of us uh, uh, know about, um, that that many of us work on, the idea that that uh, uh, we're increasingly dealing with with uh, information environments and populations uh, that that the information environments that may be uh, either promoting the spread or or, or even creating misinformation, and 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 then different um, parts of the public being uh, differentially affected by that, or being um, playing a role in disseminating um, that misinformation. So we saw different approaches from different areas of of data science, of of communication research, but also um, uh, communities of practice who are saying, well, what is the problem, and how can we solve this for this particular uh, population or underserved groups? Um, uh, the uh, the products from that are currently um, uh, being prepared um, as a special issue of the Proceedings of National Academies, um, but also since then have, have, have led to a, to a number of, of, of collaborations between um, practitioners and, and, and researchers. Um, and the topic, of course, is, is far from being solved, so this is really just the beginning of a larger conversation at the time. 
Um, the last area um, of, of activities are really internal, um, or not internal, but, but our committee helping the National Academies more broadly and, and the different divisions uh, think about what communication challenges come up in, in, in a whole variety of areas from the, the earth and life sciences uh, to the social sciences themselves and, 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 and what, how we can again use that, that interplay between research and practice to, uh, to hopefully um, find innovative ways of, of, of dealing with those challenges even better than we have in the past. Um, as far as next steps, before I, 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 I turn it over to Angela, um, I think we'll, we're, we're looking at uh, increasingly expanding our, our research for those kinds of research practice partnerships in science communication. This is really um, the, the, the goal. Um, and, uh, and, and, and as I said, to just echo uh, my earlier comments um, and also Holly's comments to, to, to really explore either areas that, that, that where, where there's a niche and where we need to push the field a little bit further or help amplify existing efforts and make them even more effective than they already are. Um, the second one is, is uh, the, the area that we're working on is, is, is uh, the idea of, of, a, of public use data sets. So the idea that, that very often um, maybe data, we don't have as much good, reliable data to guide our efforts as we would like to have or as we maybe have in some other areas. Uh, there are certainly some data sets that, uh, for example, tell us about um, deficits in knowledge or that which, which uh, populations may be particularly um, susceptible to, to misinformation, but th those are sometimes more um, haphazard in the sense that variables tend to be measured here and there, but not always systematically. Um, and they also don't always uh, kind of address the, 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 the new and emerging problems and, and for example, misinformation and, and in online environments and in, in, in environments that are heavily shaped by, by algorithmic delivery of news and so on and so forth. So uh, playing a role in, in, in bringing different groups together to think um, through what these public use data sets, meaning data sets that would be available widely to both researchers and, pract and practitioners um, would look like um, is, is the second area. And then we, we're continuing um, our, our work with the, uh, with the National Academies. Um, and and uh, as, as they're uh, thinking uh, or implementing their reorganization as well and and uh, and, and are moving are moving forward with really a lot of exciting um, initiatives so with that um, I, I don't want to use up too much time because uh, I want to uh, at least uh, I want to give a lot of time to, to both Angela and Laura um, Angela first to talk about the boundary spending and then and then we'll go over to Laura thank you so much this is Angela thanks Dietram um, so Dietra mentioned in his opening remarks that um, this committee has really been focused on a, a wide array of, of definitions of science communication and boundary spanning has been a way for the committee to focus on the, the very broad conception of science communication. So the multidimensional communication and engagement that Dietra mentioned. Um, and so for those of you who aren't familiar with this, this, this boundary spanning goes by many different terms, as we've all discovered. Um, but essentially, it's the work of um, individuals and organizations who explicitly focus on facilitating knowledge exchange and building relationships and collaborations between scientists and those who use science. So it's um, much more than communication um, at the end of a, of a research project, but rather it's the communication engagement that might happen all the way through a research process, including in the development of, of research agendas. It can also include institution and individuals who, um, who, who don't necessarily involve, um, are engaged in, in research production, but might be um, involved in work at a museum or other kind of institution where they're really focused on how do you build engagement um, uh, all the way through a process. Um, the goal of this kind of engagement and communication is to increase the chances that research more directly addresses decision maker and, and other kinds of stakeholder needs and that um, it, it also the aim is to increase the chances that research will be useful to, to society and will be used. Um, so one of the reasons that um, the, the committee has focused on this is that this kind of extensive and full spectrum engagement can also be quite a bit of work and there's not a consistent um, 
sense of, of who's doing this and what it looks like and when we need it and, and what success looks like. So um, it seemed like an opportunity to start to bring some of that together um, and to understand what we might need to, to build capacity in this area, um, both at an individual level and, and institutionally. So the, um, the committee has been focused on couple of different things. Um, one is identifying, you know, what it is that this work is, identifying what the capacity needs are, um, and, and identifying and pinpointing research needs to understand this, 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 these, these kinds of efforts more effectively, um, and to identify what kind of future research needs we might need. Um, the next step um, for the committee in this space are to uh, commission a paper to help provide this scoping and mapping of this field um, and the landscape of boundary spanning and, and um, other kinds of similar efforts and to convene a workshop to bring some key practitioners and scholars who study this together to try to understand um, to build on this mapping exercise and to try to understand where we need where we might need to go next. Thank you so much, Angela. Um, Laura, if I can just turn it over to you um, and uh, to talk about some of ins building institutional support and, and also our price planning. Great, yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone for coming today and we're eager to hear what you have to say about the things we've been working on. Um, so yeah, science communication is not necessarily uh, valued. In some cases it's mocked or disrespected in academic settings especially. Uh, so one of the things we really want to try to do is uh, incentivize people to do science communication, to do it well, um, and to, uh, to reward or recognize uh, people who do it well, institutions that support it, uh, universities that make it, you know, some, something they value, that just, you know, show the value to it. Uh, and this is part of, as Dietrich said, you know, one of the big priorities of this, uh, of this uh, subcommittee is to increase diversity in science and um, one of the best ways to do that is to, to do better outreach and, and bring in people especially young people or early career people um, so one of one of the you know, standard ways of of recognizing merit in science is of course with prizes and so we uh, we've been talking about is there some way to um, help with the development of a, of a prize that would recognize good science communication or science engagement or science um, outreach and uh, so we commissioned a paper, um, a, a very thorough review of uh, how, do how do prizes work in the sciences. Uh, there's a lot of prizes, there were a lot more than I had ever heard of. Um, unfortunately, the, really the only one that gets a lot of attention, you know, historically is the Nobel Prize, which um, as somebody who had to get up at five in the morning most of the days this week, I'm kind of done with the Nobels right now, but, uh, but they do have an important role. Um, so we talked about you know where these uh, you know who gives prizes why do they give prizes and um, one of the big takeaways is that um, well there are several prizes need to have legitimacy they need to have a community of people who recognize them endorse them make sure that they you know, that they're being awarded in the proper way um, and are supportive constituencies that are supportive um, and prizes need to have like a set of values. Uh, that that are represented by the award that they want to endorse. So those are we're still kind of in the early stages of thinking about what an award would look like. Uh, we held a meeting at the National Academies um, in July and brought together a, a nice range of people who are involved in other prizes, uh, who are involved in various types of, of science outreach and science communities. And uh, we we talked about two models. One is the Nobel model of a you know big famous person getting a big famous prize more likely you know, toward the end of their career, middle career, uh, or one or a series of, of smaller pri of, of prizes that would go to people early career. And the consensus, um, it wasn't complete unanimity, but there was a big consensus in the room that early career prizes are the most influential. Um, and I think that's, you know, if you think about academia, that can certainly be the way or for, you know, for science careers, um, that people who are uh, trying to get tenure, if, you know, an early career award like this could, could both incentivize um, their own communication and reward it in a way that's very concrete for them and for their career. Uh, so we're still, you know, thinking about what this would be, and we'd love to hear your feedback on this. Uh, there are a lot of pitfalls with prizes. Um, one of them is that people who get prizes are more likely to get more prizes. Um, so we, you know, we don't want to just reinforce 
sort of some of the, the, the reward uh, biases that are in academia already. Um, and uh, we need to, to uh, you know, build some constituencies, think about how we, you know, what we want the award specifically to recognize. Um, and, th and then in addition to that, we're hoping to, to continue talking about other ways to uh, you know, build or support institutional support for science communication. And I'll, I'll stop here so we can go to the conversation. Perfect. Thank you so much, um, um, both Laura and Angela. Um, uh, as, as, as we've said now multiple times, the, the, uh, the, the, a big part of, of this conversation or the hope from us for this conversation is to hear from, from all of you. Um, and, and most importantly, uh, to hear what you see as the, the critical needs in this space, um, and, uh, and especially as they, as they relate to work that, that, that the, the, those of us on the committee um, can do um, and can help with. Um, so any of that, but also any, of, any questions you may have or any uh, feedback, any ideas about any of the, the existing ongoing efforts uh, that you've heard would be, would be really welcome. So I just, I, 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 I'll just open it um, for discussion uh, more broadly now. And you can either jump in or, or uh, send questions by chat. Jeff, I, I, don't, I think either yeah, one is fine, right? That's exactly what I was gonna say, so you beat me to it. <laughs> so don't hurt that, folks. I'll get the ball rolling as people are typing things out. So how do you see this effort coordinating with other efforts that are looking at sort of the SciComm network? I know that there was a meeting that the, the Alda Center put on uh, out in California, um, and there's some other sort of networks that are being built up. How do you see the coordination working there? And I'll, I'll, I'll take a first stab and then, and then others can jump in. Um, I think there, there uh, two things. One is, is um, I think philosophically, a lot of the, the existing efforts um, overlap. So we're all trying to do um, we're all uh, trying to achieve similar goals, and I think that's actually a really good thing. I think it's it's really exciting to see um, uh, different players in different spaces. Um, and I, I had mentioned also the dear colleague letter from NSF, and and in different from in different spheres, uh, pushing in the same direction directions. And I think there's lots of of ongoing conversations. The way we see our role in particular is to coordinate with those existing efforts and figuring out two things. One is, are there parts of these efforts um, that, that we can help support um, and we can use the, 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 the somewhat unique position that the academies are in, in terms of advising the nation on, on, on issues surrounding science and technology um, uh, to, to amplify those efforts. And the other, the other one is, can we also agenda set in some ways, and I think we see our role, particularly when it comes to, to um, what some people call hard to reach populations, but probably a better term is hardly reached populations um, because uh, we may just have not have, have made the effort to open lines of conversation and with, with some communities um, as much as we could have. Um, so really also set the agenda a little bit in pushing in directions um, that, that, uh, that, that maybe the field or, or at least certain areas of the field um, um, haven't, haven't pushed in as much. Um, and then I think the, 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 the other thing that I would mention briefly is, is um, issues like the, uh, the science prize, and, and Laura can speak to this more, um, but I think is a, is, a, is a really good example of, of obviously lots of pr prizes, as Laura said, being in place already. Um, and so the question is, what would this additional prize do um, to, to, to add to the, to the overall positive effects of, 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 of institutionalizing and incentivizing uh, uh, high quality efforts in science communication. So that's both coordinating with, with, other, uh, with other partners and then also kind of finding the niche or the one underserved area uh, and pushing that further. So it's probably a really good example of that. But Laura, I don't know if you have anything to add. Uh, no, that's, <laughs> you got it, thanks. And there's one question um, from Emily, Laura, that maybe actually a, a really good one just to segue from here um, in the chat window. Uh, is there a prize or a recognition um, center department institutional level um, that, that, that might spur innovation, broader support for engagement? Yeah, that, that's definitely the hope. Um, so yeah, we're, we're still at the early stages of you know, what, what would this be, who would it recognize? Uh, certainly, you know, there are individual scientists who just on their own time um, 
you know, through blogs, through Twitter, through, um, through writing, through books, who are really trying to, um, and, and are successfully reaching uh, big audiences or, or hardly reached audiences. Um, but yeah, that, it would be great to, uh, to recognize uh, departments that do that, programs that do that. It doesn't have to strictly be uh, somebody you know, who's a postdoc um, in a traditional academic career trajectory. Um, we, like, we really like that idea of, of, um, of kind of spreading the recognition and spreading the encouragement around at lots of different levels uh, within the scientific establishment or beyond it. Mm -hmm. Can I follow up on that really quickly? Um, the, when you commissioned the, uh, the paper study, whatever that is, the, the list of prizes that exist, is that available anywhere? It might be nice to see that compilation. Yeah, Holly, do you, do you know we made that public? Yeah, that should be something we could share on uh, the trellis following event and on our website. Yeah, that would be great because I think just the knowledge of what's out there um, and being able to sort of cross promote and show what exists and help people see um, what's out there might also help inspire this bigger picture. How do we go from recognizing an individual to building capacity more broadly? Yeah, it's a, it's a really nice paper and it, and it did a great job of kind of getting to the motivations of prizes and the impact they have. Um, and so these, for the most part, aren't communication prizes. They're, um, they're most, most of them are, are for um, scientific achievement, but it's, it's a really interesting paper. I highly recommend it. And, and the, the, the price issue, of course, um, um, also speaks to, uh, there's another question, and uh, as I'm going through the, the chat window, um, in, in moving the needle on, on academic support for SICOM more broadly, and, and has the committee discussed um, other incentives that for, for in, in institutional change? And, and, and Eric posted uh, uh, an announcement for an event at the academies next week on on, um, on academic advancement, um, which I certainly would like to uh, draw people's attention to, but the committee has um, uh, talked about this. This also came up, Holly, at the very beginning, uh, mentioned previous colloquia on the science of science communication, and, and, uh, and also work that uh, a long time ago, the, the Public Interfaces in the Life Sciences Roundtable here at the academies did, and actually did a workshop on, on institutional incentives. Um, among other things, but this has come up in our discussions again and again and again, also the tenure and promotion guidelines, uh, and there's certainly some examples, uh, one of which would be the University of Urbana-Champaign uh, that has written public engagement um, in, 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 in at least the, 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 the idea of public engagement in their, in their tenure and promotion guidelines, um, uh, so it's a, it's a really good example uh, for an institution that, that has tried to push this a little bit further. Uh, but I, I think this is something that that will continue to be um, on our plate because it keeps coming up as a as a or at the forefront of our thinking rather because it is something that that uh, that keeps keeps coming up as a as an idea and or as something that that really um, ends up ends up um, being a, a huge challenge especially for early career uh, researchers both in the in the bench and and, and the um, and the social sciences. Um, I'm trying to see um, right now. I'm trying to talk and read questions. Well, here, why don't we feed you the questions while you talk? And listen. Right. Um, I think the, the next one in line is uh, we had a question on using sort of people who have online presences and are, you know, quote unquote, influencers have a lot of popularity. Um, is there a chance of sort of collaborating or has the committee thought about collaborating with people who may or may not actually have a connection to science in some way? and using those platforms to really get these messages out. That's a great idea. It's, um, it's not, well, I guess if, if, when, we, when we do have another round of grants or when we do you know, have more progress on the prizes, um, that's a good idea for, for communicating to a larger audiences what we're, what we're doing here. Um, in general, I think some science communicators are doing a nice job of this. And I think one of the one of the um, commenters mentioned this. Um, there's some really clever work on different platforms. Um, right now at the Post, we're trying to do TikTok, uh, despite some issues with um, China sponsoring it. Um, 
anyhow, so yeah, that's that's something we we want to encourage in in various ways that uh, to to re you know reach people where they are. And some of that, of course, also becomes a, a research problem um, in the sense that uh, you know we, we what are the most effective ways of of of, of connecting influencers and now we have this this whole discussion of nano influencers are those that are you know with maybe a smaller number of followers actually more in, more impactful than, than others uh, so also partnering I think with researchers that 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 work in the space of this goes back to misinformation of course because it works both positively and negatively I think there, there's also a, 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 a work that the committee will do in in, in connecting and this came come to, came directly out of the uh, the misinformation uh, meeting that we had in Irvine um, so both uh, as a research and 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 then and then uh, practice um, kind of challenge and opportunity. Um, the uh, the the question, another question that we have on the on the docket here that uh, is is uh, are there are there question are there longer term plans for the for the grants? Um, and uh, and I, I, again, I can I can take a, a first stab at this. Um, and 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 the, the grants are designed. There, there, there were really two grants, and the link actually has been posted in the in the in the chat window for those of you who are interested. So you can read a little bit more about those. And as I said, you'll you'll hear more about them over time anyway. Uh, but one of them is a is a planning grant that's that's really designed to to get a, a collaboration off the ground. Uh, the other ones are are four collaborations that are pretty well planned and pretty well um, spelled out. Um, and are both really, really exciting. I think all three are really exciting, but um, the, 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 the ongoing collaborations. Um, and the idea, of course, is to, is to basically um, seed, or not of course, but the idea is to, to seed these collaborations and, and really make them sustainable um, um, over time. Um, and so the, uh, the, uh, the, the, will the grant program continue, which is one additional way of reading that question. Uh, that's something that we're working on to see um, to which degree, and this may be a really good example for something where, on the one hand, so far the committee has played a, a somewhat central role in helping connecting uh, philanthropies with with these projects down the road. Um, this may be one of those great examples of something that the committee gets underway, but then really um, other stakeholders um, um, take over, and 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 that would, of course, in many ways be be our ideal scenario for many of our efforts that. That we get them underway, but they become institutionalized um, over time. Uh, so, uh, a great question, and, and, and b something that we're that that we're thinking about as well. Jeff, is there anything that you have lined up? Yeah, Kishore asked one that's way up in the chat, so not worth scrolling through for you. But basically, he asked basically says that people are in science communication, public engagement are, are leaving the field because there doesn't seem to be a very defined career. Path. I think a lot of us who are in the field notice that you sort of go sideways rather than going uh, straight forward. So is there any consideration uh, with the committee discussions on this idea of professionalization of science communication and public engagement as a career? This is Angela. Oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, I think that part of part of what we're trying to explore with this um, effort to focus on boundary standing is is what's um, not just what that looks like right now, but what's the potential to build capacity in that space. And that means um, professionalizing it in some way because there's, um, it's quite a bit of work. So we're trying to get a sense of what it looks like right now and then where it could go and what that would mean in terms of changes at institutions, um, at universities and other, other, not just research institutions, but, but you know, NGOs and other, other kinds of institutions. Laura? Yeah, and so speaking not so much for the committee, but um, as a former president of the National Association of Science Writers, um, I see some of you are, are members and are joining us. Thanks for coming. Um, it's a 2,500 member organization of people who are professional science writers of, or communicators of any kind. Uh, so we have a lot of public information officers, people who work at museums, people who work for various NGOs, uh, journalists, freelancers. So if anybody here is interested in, in finding out more about what the, what the current professional options are, I encourage you to join. Um, but there's a lot, you know, there, the need is much greater than the, than the supply at this point. 
And, and the last thing that I'll add to what already has been said is I, I do think that there are different levels of professionalization to Kishore, to your question, um, in different fields. Um, I have mentioned this before, um, at the University of Wisconsin, for instance, we have a, a PhD minor, a transcriptable PhD minor for students in the bench sciences who then get a PhD in, let's say, genetics or material science with a PhD minor in science communication on their diploma. Um, and a lot of them go naturally into careers that are that are professional science writing careers. Um, a lot of the students in communication do, but I think that is one community of many uh, that do science communication. And, and, and so um, uh, bringing different communities to the, to the table who traditionally, who either may not see themselves as much as science communication as they see themselves as another field, but they really are doing science communication they, the way we define it, is part of our is part of our, our our work, and I think that gets a little bit in our mission. That gets a little bit in another question that that asks about uh, uh, K through 12 communities and 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 if they're considered to be to be part of the space, how how teachers um, convey science and so on and so forth. Uh, and then there are lots of other groups in that in that question as well. And and Angela, I was wondering if 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 that's a good jumping off point on on highlighting some of the discussions that we've had about about. Other other disciplines and 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 other networks, scholarly and and, and practice and and boundary spanning uh, between those. Yeah. So one of the I mean, this goes to sort of the committee trying to get a sense of what this space looks like when you when you when you start to broaden out what science communication um, entails. You know, who who else is in this space? And so. We've been thinking um, a lot about um, those who um, those who think about you know how not just how to communicate science but how do you know that it's it's taken up into policy or practice in some way. So there's a research use um, community of practice, and there's um, other kinds of of um, community practice around like knowledge brokering and. Um, uh, knowledge synthesis centers who are all thinking about this as well and they all use communication quite a bit in their work they just may not think about themselves as science communicators so we're trying to get a sense of what does that what does that ecosystem look like and how can we leverage all the good work that's going on in these different spaces so that we we can um, we, you know we can be more effective all together mm -hmm. Jeff are there other questions that you have Ditram, Ditram, this is Itzhak. Can I um, say something? Absolutely, please do jump in. Um, so Itzhak, it's it's like, can you members. introduce yourself as a co committee member as well? And I want to make two quick comments. I think one is about how do we build this, how do we draw attention to science communication at the institutional level. I want to point out that many funding agencies right now, NIH, NSF included, have an engagement core that comes as, as mandatory for many of these opportunities. And that's an opportunity for you to advocate, uh, you know, we do it at Rutgers uh, right now, we put science communication up front as part of that engagement, the core engagement mission of a university, particularly if it's a land-grant institution. And we make sure that people know that we exist on campus and we do things, so I would encourage everybody to do that. As for the K-12 uh, piece, I think we obviously, Everybody belongs here, and I think one of the ways with the standing committee members can help you is we can be happy to give talks. So I know I'm speaking in about two weeks uh, about science communication to uh, the National uh, Research Practice Partnership in Education. And, and, and so I'm happy to share what I know from communication, how it can be used in an educational setting. So think about us as a resource, and we can help you and think through this kind of thing. And, and Itzhak is a, a committee member as well, just for, for everybody. Um, Jeff, so do you have? Of, Go ahead. Yeah, it sort of builds on a question we got uh, from Jeannie and the crew at Rockefeller. Is, you know, what, how can people who are on this webinar or just in the community in general, like, what, can, what can be provided to you? How can this be sort of a collaborative effort? What are you looking for from those who are in the community? So I, I'll take a first stab, and I'll, I'll let others um, um, chime in um, from the from the committee. I, I think the committee is is I mean, a this is this is a first step in in or one way of of, of us uh, connecting with different communities. Um, I think others uh, will 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 follow in, in in different modalities. 
um, but I would encourage everyone um, for uh, who, who either is individually for that matter to, to connect with different committee members um, to let us know what, what you think really some of the, 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 the core challenges are or the core opportunities. And I think even just going through the, the, the chat window, some of the, 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 the statements that are more phrased as comments other than questions are already invaluable. But number two, and I think this is, um, and other, some have already done this as institutions. So, um, the, the, you know, groups, um, uh, different communities of practice that have said, we want to, uh, can we have a conversation of, 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 of where we might be able to join forces where you can help us um, and so on and so forth. Uh, but, but number three, I think the, uh, as I said, the, for, for us, um, this is really a, an, an, an ongoing process where we're, where we're also uh, looking at, 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 uh, at, uh, at challenges as they emerge and, and, and really want to get ahead of them rather than, than anything else. So uh, even content um, input would be, would be um, invaluable. Um, I don't know, Laura, if there's, and, and, and Angela, and, and Itzhak as well for that matter, if there's um, anything else from, from, from your end. Yeah, especially for, for the work we're doing on boundary spanning, um, I think we're still trying to figure out what the what the universe is of, of people who are doing various types of science engagement and outreach. And Holly, do what's the best way for for people to contact? I mean, most of us are easy to find as individuals, but is is there a best way for people to to get in touch with the committee? Sure. Um, well, I think one one way that would be um, helpful would be just to contact me um, as the um, study director because I can direct comments to you know committee members and I, we also have people's um you know all of the contact information listed on our website and that we'll be showing that web address at the end um and make sure that everyone has that um you can also sign up that we do have a place to sign up for updates about the committee but that's in terms of dialogue i think um you know contacting me and or reaching out to committee members um it would be would be fine um, and I'll, I'll provide my contact information in the chat and then Angela, do you want to maybe quickly also mention the, the, the workshop that may come out of the Boundary Spanners group that, that really would be a way of systematically getting input? Yeah, so we, um, we are planning to hold a workshop sometime in 2020 um, that would bring together um, those who are practicing in this space, in this sort of full spectrum engagement and communication. Um, and and to help identify then what are what are the next steps so that's i don't know quite how the the process will look for, like for involvement in that but we'll we'll certainly be um be letting this group know and others that 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 that's what you know that that'll be happening and what that um what the components of that workshop will be but i would say for this group one of the things we're really interested in is again sort of mapping who's who's in this space but also what the needs are because it's so difficult to figure out who who's doing what um it's also hard to difficult it's also difficult to figure out what what are the needs so um letting us know you know that these are the the challenges with um you know being a practitioner in this space that that helps us understand how to shape shape this inquiry going forward Jeff, are there any other questions that you have on the docket? I'm not sure if you're muted, Jeff, or if that's me not hearing right. Sorry, uh, I was going to say, I think I got through them all, but if you haven't asked one, um, or if you've asked one and I didn't get to it, please shout it out, and at least just added one there into the box. Um, and, and while you're reading this and, and, and curating it, the one thing that I will mention to the, or add to the previous answer, for those of you who were able to be at the, um, at the Irvine meeting, um, there's a big screen with a visualization of the field that, uh, that Jevin West at, at the University of Washington did for us um, that, that looked at the field from a, from a research perspective. Um, so this is really just one layer of the many layers that we've already discussed. Um, but it, it was it, 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 the reason why we why we commissioned that work initially was was partly because of course we were interested in who the players in the field are, but also because it gave us a really good tool, or it, it will give us an even better tool 
at, at figuring out what disciplines we may be drawing from or we may be speaking to implicitly without either those disciplines or those fields of study or those fields of practice seeing themselves as, as part of the conversation around science communication simply because they may be using a different vernacular um, or, or simply occupying a different space, but one that um, where we just haven't joined forces even though we, we should be around that larger problem um, so eventually there will be a, a, a shareable version of that as well. And, and, and I think that's a, an, an interesting tool, at least, at least for the, as I said, for the research layer of that conversation. Great. Uh, so the question from Elise basically boils down to, you know, prizes and all are great, but that sort of presupposes that somebody has all this extra time to do the engagement on top of all their other responsibilities. And has there been any consideration of ways to essentially, you know, cover some of their time so that scientists you know who are in the lab actually are have the capacity to go and do this engagement on top of their other responsibilities mm -hmm. um this is this is angela um i mean it's one of the reasons that we are focusing on, on this boundary spanner intermediary space is because this this isn't intended to be boundary spanning in addition to everything else that a researcher might be doing, but can we build capacity for individuals to to focus on this full time if possible so that they'd work in partnership with um, with researchers who want to be engaged but don't have the time um, and that that is something that's happening at various um, research institutions across the world. So it's, it's, it'll be good for us to figure out what that looks like and what are the options there, because I do think this it's a huge amount of work to do this well. Um, and um, it's, it's hard to know how to best, how to best support that. But yeah, we are, we're, we're thinking about, you know, how to, that goes back to the professionalizing question too. And then, you know, what would it look like to actually provide support for researchers to, to be able to do this um, to do this well, whether in partnership with boundary standards or on their own. And I want to use that also briefly. That, that it's a great question and, and to loop back to our work within the academies because, of course, a lot of the recent reports um, from the academies on gene drives, on, on human genome editing and others have had whole chapters on um, how we need broader engagement with the public and that need these multi-directional dialogues around not just the science itself, but it's ethical and, 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 and legal and, and political and societal uh, access and equity um, implications. Um, and very often, um, both, the, both the reports and, and, and the committees, um, you know, kind of approach this as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a problem that, that we haven't really thought about all that much, how science is going to do this, bench science in particular, on top of everything else, how they can partner with professionals in the field and so on and so forth. Um, how they can partner with social scientists um, uh, to help them through and other scientists uh, to, to think through that. Um, and so I, I think the, the, the hope for our committee is to, to also um, steer some of that um, re-emphasis or help, not steer is the wrong word, but, but help um, with that re-emphasis uh, uh, that, 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 that would allow scientists to, 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 to not just spend time on this, but that being valued and that being written explicitly into, into reports that the academies is, are, are producing and raising those questions early on in the process rather than really just seeing that as, as, as a dissemination um, um, problem. So those are ongoing conversations, um, and, and I think that's where the committee will play an important role um, indirectly, as I'm, my hope, my personal hope is that the committee will play an important role there as well. Yeah, so th those last two comments really sort of are in line with what you were just talking about of sort of integrating communication as part of the expectation yep. for scientists. Absolutely. And, and I mean, that's actually the, the, the one thing that I'll say about this. What, what's really exciting is that a lot of surveys of scientists show a, a, an increasing uh, a, a willingness that's much higher among younger cohorts of scientists and, and a general uh, indication that that's just a, that that is part of the DNA. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll see a culture we are seeing already and, and we will be seeing even more of a culture change um, over time. That's, that's not the, 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 the ideal way of bringing about change, but I think it's a really good, um, a really good indicator that, that, that things are going in the right direction. And that's that's one thing we hope to do, and I'm sure all of you too is is uh, sort of amplify or or accelerate that real change um, within traditional science. 
um, it's a little hard. I mean, you know, science is ridiculously hierarchical and, and you know, there are so many career stages and uh, it's great that younger scientists are, are kind of recognize how important and interesting it is and how good it is for their, you know, for them to get interesting questions and, and um, you know, in collaborations and, and get more attention for their, for their work uh, and get new ideas for their work. Um, but the tenure committees generally are, are not of a generation that has, has recognized the importance here. So the more all of us can do to, to kind of push that cultural change, the, the faster it will happen. Yep. And I, I agree with every single comment that's come in in the last five minutes. So. <laughs> yeah, the comments are great. Can we, yeah. I, just logistically, we can capture these, right? Will there be a record? Yeah, yeah they'll be recorded and then Everything that's come in there, we will try to organize, especially uh, there's a lot of hyperlinks that are being thrown around. Um, so those will all be posted on the, the Trellis website um, and on the, the event links so that we have them a little more organized. Yeah, I did, I did share the Dear Colleague letter as well because a number of people asked, so that should be up there now as well. Um, I'm just going to throw up real quick the uh, link to the committee website. Um, so, you, as Holly said, you can find contact information there and updated information about what's going on with the committee. And again, you can contact Holly for information on how to contact the individual committee members. Um, but yeah, I think the point here is that this is sort of just getting started as an effort and input is welcome. And I think that, you know, we're really excited to hear you guys talk about what your thoughts and dreams and hopes are for the committee going forward, especially at this stage when it's just getting started. Um, I think rather than ask for another question, which could take us a, a while, um, I'm just gonna sort of call it a little early uh, and thank everybody, uh, Angela, Laura, and Dietram and Holly for joining us. I thank all of you for participating and asking questions. I'll leave this on for a few minutes. Um, the one thing I'm gonna do the last minute is uh, share my screen just to get uh, the slide up there with, uh, this is the website, and so this way it's just sort of on the recording so everybody can see it, and that will be good enough for that. All right, so uh, thanks to everybody for joining us. We will have our next version of SciEngage next month, uh, November 8th. Uh, same time, noon Eastern, we'll have Sunshine actually presenting about the inclusive SciCom meeting that took place last month. Um, I was in Peru, so I couldn't go, but I've heard great things through the grapevine, and so it'll be very exciting to hear sort of the outputs of that and next steps uh, for that meeting. Uh, so join us again, and thank you, everybody. Again, if you haven't put your email address into the chat box and you want to be added to the mailing list, please do that. Um, and I think that's all the housekeeping. Emily, am I forgetting anything? Nope, I think that's everything. All right. Cool. And uh, again, further communication, you can go on the Trellis website or the AAAS website where the event is posted. And if there are other questions, comments, anything like that, we'll keep it going. So thank you, everybody. And we will talk oh, to you. Oh, did, did you answer the question about the NAS convocation live stream for next week? Uh, there will be a live stream. OK, there will be a live stream of the convocation that Eric mentioned. <laughs> yes. All right, cool. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.